Kessner, the lifetime Evanstonian, a climate reality leader and mentor trained by Al Gore. He serves on the board of, Ev of Citizens Greener Evanston and Wild Onion Market, an up and coming food co op. Rachel's a former classroom teacher, now an environmental educator, activist, and organizer. Most recently, she was the executive administrator at Collective Resource, where she hopes to return when the corona crisis passes. She's currently a curriculum consultant with Evan Stem's Climate Action Project for sixth grade. And then we have Erlene Howard and Mary Beth Shea. Erlene Howard is the founder and owner of Evanston based Collective Resource Compost. She started the business 10 years ago feels very lucky to have worked that aligns with her values. She's presenting with her employer and employee, excuse me, and zero waste consultant, Mary Beth Shea, who's celebrating her ninth anniversary of working with her. So those are our, that's our distinguished panel of speakers. Um, before we go th oh, um, on with the program though, I kind of like to go around and I'll call on folks and ask you to introduce yourself if you can. And sorry for my dog that just got excited about the, somebody delivering something. You'll, you'll probably hear from him again before this is over. <laughs> so, um, so we've already, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the screen as I'm seeing it. So my, the next person who hasn't been introduced is Angela. You want to give us, uh, you want to let us know who, uh, introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Angela Antosca. I'm with the Evanston Chamber of Commerce. I'm the membership and development director. So I'm happy to be on this call and to learn about all this information the presenters have to share. So thanks for being here. Great. Mary Jane. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Alagabon. I'm from Coin Insurance, where I do uh, personal and commercial insurance. So I'm always looking for things to help my my business owners, and if they have any questions for me, I like to answer it. So I always like to share resources. Okay, terrific. Sarah Jane. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah Jane Abbott. I'm the marketing director for the Ever Evanston Chamber of Commerce and um, I'm here to support for everybody's need to uh, get your business to some more visibility. Right. Kathleen? Hello. There you go. <laughs> I'm, Ka I'm Kathleen Brooks. A member of the chamber, I work with Legal Shield. Uh, we provide legal and identity theft services for families, and we also work with business owners. Um, and I'm just particularly interested in this topic and want to learn more about it, about green businesses. So that's why I'm here today. Terrific. Sam? I am Sibley, Evanston Fourth of July Association. I see what's said. Great, and uh, you look like you're out in the uh, out in the desert there. Well, ah, you're using <laughs> Zoom. You can choose a background. Do you know how to do that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Everybody else? <laughs> yeah, we've all we all tried it. We were just commenting how sometimes it looks good, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I've had backgrounds where I put myself in China and on the beach in Cuba, but in this room, it doesn't work because of the lighting. So, uh, you know, what can you do? What can you do? Thanks for joining us, Sam. Okay. Um, the gentleman from Red Hot Chili Pepper, could you introduce yourself again, sir? Hi, my name is Ramakant Karel. I own a uh, first restaurant is uh, Mount Everest. It has been almost 20 past years in Evanston and the Red Hot Chili Pepper. Is a new baby. It's been about three, two and a half years. Terrific. And I see we have another person um, who's joined us. If you could introduce yourself, or I think this person left. They got shy. <laughs> All right. Is there anybody on the phone who has on the call who's not introduced himself? Oh, here's Elaine. Let's let Elaine in. Okay, Elaine. Elaine, can you hear us? Hi, sorry I'm late. <laughs> no problem, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Elaine Kemna Irish, and I represent uh, Workonomy Coworking. That's part of Office Depot, uh, which is an essential business. So we are open right now and we're having virtual meetings and events. So if anybody wants to 
partner with me on that. I would love to promote your virtual meeting. And um, of course, the store has supplies that you might need when you're working at home. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Great, great. All right, well, let's, um, before we launch into the presentations, let's kind of do a little bit of the rules of the road, which is, um, it's hard to do Q and A, and even though everybody can see each other, it's very hard to do Q and A in this kind of environment. And I'm sure people are going to have questions. So what, what I'm going to ask is if you could do your your, your questions in the chat box, and um, you can either I would suggest that you address them to me, and then I'll kind of be the I'll, I'll run the Q and A to where we get to the end of the presentations. So if you could do that, then I'll know who they come from and. If you could also indicate to me who you want to ask the question to, that would be great. And so we'll manage the Q&A that way. Um, and that's, uh, if you have anything you want to share, um, feel free to share that also in the chat box. If you've got um, links or things that you think are important that you want to share as far as that, go ahead and do that as well. And I see Brittany Giroux from the city has joined. And um, that's good. So. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to Hal Sprague, for, uh, the Citizens of Greener Evanston, and Hal, the floor is yours. Terrific. I'm going to share my screen so that we have a, uh, something to look at, if I can make this work. I only have two slides, so not to worry. Oops, <laughs> need to do that. There we go. Okay, that's what we're going to start with. So I, as Roger said, I'm Hal Sprague, um, and I want to thank Roger and the Chamber for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm wearing two hats. Again, as Roger said, I'm President of Citizens Greener Evanston, and I'm also Community Outreach Coordinator at a company called Trajectory Energy Partners, and I'll be talking about that later. First, I want to talk for just a minute about Citizens Greener Evanston. I'm not sure if our members here know much about it. Um, Going back, way, way back to 2005, a group of Evanstonians formed to help the city adopt its first climate action plan, which actually came about in 2008. And since then, the group has been working with the city to implement the plan's goals, which had to do with reducing greenhouse gases. Later, there was a second plan called the Livability Plan. And then finally, last year in, well, two years ago now, in December of 2018, the city adopted its third plan, what's called the Climate Action and Resilience Plan, or CARP, we lovingly call it. Um, and that, uh, that original band of, of activists uh, is now um, a 501c3 called Citizens Greener Evanston. We have about uh, 2,700 members, and we have about eight programs, uh, all uh, with lots of expertise in each of the areas. Um, these, thing, these different areas include uh, natural habitat, habitat protection, water management, waste management, transportation and mobility, energy conservation and renewable energy, climate action, local food production, and environmental justice. And I don't know if you would recognize this, but this is the current climate action and resilience plan. And each of our programs at CGE is focused on meeting the goal of the overriding goal of the plan, which as you can see here is making the city carbon neutral by 2050, which is a tall order, but um, we think we can do it. Um, and, I, and so I know that with the businesses here on the call, you guys are focused really hard on surviving <laughs> the, the current crisis. And that's, that's, and you have, fortunately, we have lots of help in different areas to help you do that. I would also submit that this is the time we also need to be planning for what, is, what will become the new normal. Um, and planning now is important because I think we all realize that one of the reasons we're in the pickle that we're in is because, at least partly because we, uh, at different levels, uh, we had less planning than we should have had. Um, CGE has developed a really nice working relationship with Roger and the Chamber. And we, uh, we want to continue that and work closely uh, with the businesses that are members and do what we can with our expertise to help all of you uh, in your efforts to be more green, um, to deal with climate change, become more sustainable. 
Um, I think we all need to imagine an Evanston with sustainability as a central element, um, particularly in the businesses that call Evanston home. So having said all that, I will now get out of the way and uh, let Rachel Rosner take over uh, in telling you a little bit about climate change and what we can do about it. Rachel, you're on mute. You need to un you need to unmute yourself, Roger. You need to unmute Rachel. There, did that work? Yep, yep. Phew, I, I was having a little mouse problems there. Thank you for your patience. Well, what I was saying is thank you so much for showing up for this call because I think these are weighty times and and um, there's a very bright and hopeful piece about your desire to green your business and um there's also a weighty piece of looking at the problems that that mandate that you do so so i appreciate everyone for for joining um oh lord i am having issues sorry guys big issues it may be why would this be a really problematic situation? Thank you. I, you know what? I feel like actually maybe somebody else needs to go ahead while I solve this. I mean, it's like, I'm not, I'm frozen. I don't know, you're not frozen. Can you hear me? I can. You can, yeah. I mean, truly like, I, my screen is like not doing anything. I'm not sure what to do. I don't see a arrow. Bad news, you guys. I'm so sorry. We practiced. I say, um, Erlene and Mary Beth forge ahead. Oh, I have to figure out how to stop. Sharing. Why don't you unshare and then share again? See what happens. Okay. Thank you for your patience. All. Okay. New share. Did you use the share at the bottom of the screen, Rachel? No. There's a share screen at the bottom. If you hover in the, at the bottom of your screen, it says share screen. Let's try now. Does that work? Yay. Or no. Hmm. Well, awkward. Well, let's just, we're going to do this version then, I guess. Very strange. I don't know. Is this okay? Super clumsy. Okay. Well, so I'm starting this story with Eli and Bella. These are my kids about 11 years ago. And um, you know, my background is, was mentioned is in environmental education and I was a classroom teacher as well. Connecting kids and nature is a really big part of my story. And kids and nature are the two things that have the most at stake in the face of the climate crisis. Uh, this is Eli and Bella now, which goes to show that a lot can change in a lot of years. And the significance of that number is, you may know, is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has, um, is anybody else getting an echo? No, just me. Okay. You are. Um, said that we have 11 years to make some radical changes to the way we operate or uh, we'll lose the ability to, to mitigate the worst effects of the climate crisis. So when I think about what the world's gonna be like 11 years from now, when Eli and Bella are the age that I was when I had them, I'm highly motivated to do everything in my power to, to make changes. And that's why I uh, seize the opportunity to uh, get trained as a climate reality leader by Al Gore. Um, the outline of his presentation, I'm gonna try this again, is must we change, can we change, will we change? And the must we change is the heaviest part of the story when we really have to kind of take a hard look at reality. Oh, it's working. Um, and nobody else is having this echo. 
We're good. Okay. Um, so, you know, when you look up at the sky on a blue sky day, which we haven't got right now, it looks infinite. The reality is that um, if I turn my up on end and go straight up, it would take six minutes to reach that upper limit, that upper line, the atmosphere, the limit of the sky, the, the thin little bubble of breathable air that we all share on this planet. And every day, we're dumping 110 million tons of pollution into our bubble. This is a little uh, firmer on the greenhouse effect, right? For millennia, the Earth has been the Goldilocks planet with sunlight coming down just the right amount, staying, being absorbed by the Earth, staying in our atmosphere, just the right amount bouncing back through our blanket out into space. And um, as we thicken that blanket that is our atmosphere by adding greenhouse gases, we're upsetting that balance and things are getting hotter. These are the major sources of those greenhouse gases. A, a large percentage of um, our electricity in Illinois comes from coal-fired power plants. Uh, obviously, uh, driving cars is burning fossil fuels as well. Um, landfills is one that I learned about more recently, and you'll probably hear more about from Erlene and Mary Beth. But when you uh, throw away food scraps, they, they emit methane, which is uh, 50 per times more powerful than carbon dioxide and uh, cows emit methane as well. You'll be hearing about corollary solutions to that. And, um, scientists have been able to, to draw the line between this uphill slope of our burning of, ca of carbon to this uphill slope of rising temperatures. And indeed the last, really my kid's entire lifetime have been the hottest years on record. And we know last July was the hottest month ever. And we're experiencing days where, that are really too hot to, for many people to safely go outside, hot to enjoy being outside. That's happening already in Evanston. Happening a lot more in the global south and predicted to happen up to 60 days a year uh, by the end of the century if we don't make drastic changes. That extreme heat is also happening at the poles. Uh, I doctored this slide myself. There have definitely been records broken at the North Pole, but uh, in February it reached 64 degrees in Antarctica. So definitely not normal. And the vast majority of that human-made heat is going into our oceans. That warming water is leading to more frequent, more intense, and longer lasting storms. Harvey is one, but I'm sure you could all rattle off several, mostly again in the global south, mostly impacting low income communities. Um, because that ocean air is warming, the, the storms linger longer. And in fact, there was um, so much rain over Houston that it is actually two inches lower above sea level than it was before the storm. And this is when we have to really talk about uh, justice because almost 3,000 people died in Puerto Rico, almost right, same as 9-11. And, and we know that um, the story would have been different if the population had maybe been um, white and affluent. We would have treated things differently. Um, the, that warming ocean temperatures also affects the water cycle as, uh, warmer water evaporates more, warmer air holds more water vapor, and then we have these massive precipitation events like none of us saw as kids, right? These rain bombs and snow bombs, and again, longer lasting, more frequent, and more intense. And all of these things I'm mentioning are happening on every inhabited continent. <clears throat> uh, last spring was the hottest period on record in the U.S. Uh, not hottest, wettest. Sorry, there it is again. Um, we know that Lake Michigan levels are rising with that, that the flooding is impacting our farmers and our food supply and ultimately our food cost, which again is an is a economics and class issue. And uh, there's 
you know, huge human costs and huge monetary costs. And uh, definitely every continent is experiencing this issue as well. So that same heat that's causing uh, oceans to evaporate, leading to more storms and floods, is also causing moisture from, to evaporate from the land, leading to droughts, again, all over the world. And again, impacting our food supply and economy in dramatic ways. Um, this is sort of the, the web of impacts. Oops, sorry, I flew through that one. That are, I'm gonna go back. Um, impacting our food supply. Um, right. This is all tied to climate, though it's little reported on. I feel like so many of these issues are, are interconnected and go back to this major issue. Uh, and global stability is also uh, a part of this story in a big way, right? So uh, in Syria, a million and a half people were forced to move into cities because their, their land was no longer farmable, and that led to major instability, ultimately mass migration. We could even say led to the election of xenophobic leaders. I mean, it's really a cascade of impacts. And similar things are happening in North America. Honduras is the fourth most impacted country uh, uh, by climate change. They're also experiencing severe drought, leading to mass migration here as well. Uh, all that dry plant matter and increased lightning strikes means more fires, again, on every continent, but uh, uh, especially in the American West, California has been hit heavily. Now Australia has sort of become the poster child of climate fires. And again, I don't feel like climate is mentioned in the reporting of this nearly enough. This is a more typical response. And I think, you know, in many ways, environmentalism is seen as tree huggers, polar bears, and uh, it's painful to raise kids in the face of a mass extinction. And at the same time, ultimately, I think it's at this point important to really see this also as a, as a human crisis. And uh, it's a health crisis as well, right? All these things we've been talking about, injuries, heat, stress. Um, I'm going to get into some more here. Uh, yeah, air pollution kills 9 million people a year. But this slide actually tells an interesting story now because it does not look like this now under these conditions. My understanding is that the Himalayas are visible for the first time in decades as air pollution has decreased as people are uh, sheltering in place. Now we can't say, oh, we wish it would just stay like this because there's so many other factors, but it is an opportunity to reset and reevaluate what we want moving forward. And again, it's a justice issue at its core. Black kids are 10 times as likely to die from asthma as white kids. In Illinois, we have more coal-fired power plants and communities of color than any other state. And diseases that used to only exist in the tropics can now live further afield as temperatures rise. I threw this one in uh, because I think that the psychological piece is really important. I know a lot of our kids are suffering from anxiety and depression and sort of paralysis in the face of this issue. And, uh, and we have to really look at that emotional part of the story in order to roll up our sleeves and do the work. And the financial piece is massive. So it's very short-sighted when people say we can't afford to implement the solutions because in reality, we cannot afford not to. So normally at this point, I would maybe do a little emotional check-in and, and see what people are thinking, but instead I'm just gonna answer this question for you. Yes, we must change, the, the reality is. This next part gets a little more hopeful. Our young leader, Greta, has said yes, the solutions already exist. They really do. It's just a matter of having the will to implement them. We have enough wind blowing around our planet to meet our energy needs 40 times over. 
and the capacity is going up and it's getting cheaper and more popular. Enough sun re reaches the earth every hour to meet our energy needs for a whole year. And again, we're outpacing projections in a big way, which I think is a really hopeful part of the story. When people feel like, oh, I, we can't do it. It's too big, it's too much, but, but we're already outpacing what, what had been anticipated. Um, in fact, coal-fired power plants, more have been shut down under Trump than were under Obama, and that's driven by economics, not by policy, despite the fact that our government subsidizes the heck out of out of fossil fuel industry and does not subsidize re renewable energy nearly the same. Uh, divestment is happening either for financial or political reasons, which is heartening. Electric vehicles are getting cheaper and more popular, and along with that is the popularity and ability to use bikes and public transit. And this is a huge economic boon. I mean, solar jobs are the fastest growing in the, com in the country. Um, and all these companies have committed to 100% renewable energy because, I mean, possibly greenwashing, possibly values driven, but for sure they know that this is, this is something of value to their customers. People want to make a difference. So yes, we absolutely have the capacity to change. And now will we change is the big question that comes back to all of us, right? Uh, the Paris Agreement, Obama signed, all leaders of the world said yes. We're at the five-year mark where they're, they're re-upping their commitments. And our current president said we're withdrawing, but the reality is we're not officially out of that agreement until the day after election day, which is why it's so critical that we all work hard to elect leaders that understand science and appreciate it. The other good news is that many states and cities and other entities are, are making their own Paris commitments. And you'll see Evanston on this map. We were the first city in Illinois to pass a plan. So it's pretty historic. Evanston is in a leadership role in, in this movement. And um, these are cities that are already there, 100% renewable electricity. And we are on that path. And this is that climate action plan that Hal pointed out. Uh, the mayor enlisted 17 you know, geniuses in Evanston who volunteered a year of their time to put this plan together. And it has some very ambitious goals and also accounts for resiliency. So this is when we're talking about how right now we're sort of dealing with a lack of preparedness for this crisis. We need to be thinking forward about how to be prepared and mitigate the, the next crisis. Project Drawdown is a favorite of mine. I highly recommend you visit their website. I got to go to a conference about it. You'll notice number three on this list is reducing food waste, and that includes uh, composting, which you'll be hearing about shortly. Number four, a plant-rich diet, which does not mean you have to go vegan, but just to, to front plants and um, Number eight is solar farms, which you'll be hearing about from Hal. And number 11, regenerative agriculture. I just am throwing in, because I'm on the board of Wild Onion Market. We're just in the process of shifting our name from Rogers Park, Rogers Park Food Co-op. And I mention this because we've had nine new owners since this crisis ensued. I think people are really in a place where they want to feel like they're part of a solution, that they're very community oriented and thinking also about sustainable food systems moving forward. Um, I think we are on the precipice of the next massive cultural shift, and it's going to be the sustainability revolution. Uh, that's what's required. That's what we're able to do. These are some organizations that I follow. I'll try and put them in comments while other people are talking um, to stay informed and active. I highly recommend this video by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez about the Green New Deal. Uh, I'm super inspired and moved and hopeful uh, by the youth movement globally. That's my daughter Bella with the megaphone. But uh, the message there is that if 3.5% of the population is engaged in a movement, that's when leaders start to follow. And so I hope you're all joining that movement. And uh, I love this quote that Al Gore 
shares from Wallace Stevens. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. And that is all I've got. And now I will unshare. Thanks, Mary Beth. I will unshare my screen. Bravo. Thank you. Whew. It was stressful at first, but I pulled it out. Okay. I Technology passed. always does that to you. <laughs> <laughs> to you, Erlene and Mary Beth. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today and celebrating Earth Day with us. I am Erlene Howard, the founder and owner of Collective Resource Compost. We started 10 years ago. What's your name? Uh, my name is Mary Beth Shea, and I'm a zero waste consultant. And I started working for Collective Resource Compost exactly nine years ago today on Earth Day 2011. <clears throat> Why did you start a composting business, Erlene? I wanted to make it easy so compost could be happening by lots and lots of people. So uh, do you know why it's uh, important for our planet for us to be composting? So many reasons, right? Yes. To start, it just completely replicates what the Earth would do if we weren't here. Mm -hmm. And it gives nutrients back to our soil. Yes. It also makes the soil more robust, so it holds its water better instead of the water running off into the sewer. And seeds generate more successfully in compost amended soil, like 80% more successfully. And when we're talking to kids, we um, tell them that it gives the soil superpowers. <laughs> it also creates more room in the landfill for the things that cannot be composted or recycled. Why doesn't organic material biodegrade and turn into compost at landfills? Why do we have to separate it out? Yeah, so landfills are not the right environment for food scraps. They get covered with plastic and other trash and they fester and they create methane. Wait, isn't methane a greenhouse gas? <laughs> it is, and I heard Rachel quote uh, 50 times more dangerous than CO2. I've heard 85 times more dangerous because it builds on itself. And so that is building global warming and contributing to climate change. So composting is a way of mitigating climate change? Yep. Cool. So you talked about reducing landfill use. Why is that important? Well, one of the things that's really important is we don't wanna be moving our trash further and further and further away, especially when it's things that could be dealt with locally and compost is local. So if I have a yard, why can't I compost myself? Why do I need a service? Oh, there are so many people who can compost in their yard and we have resources to help you do that. But the reason that you would wanna use a commercial composting service is that it's everything that was once alive. It includes meat and dairy, food soiled paper, compostable, all in the same bucket. Is composting yucky? <laughs> it's not the yuckiest thing. One of our uh, customers recently reminded us, which we obviously already know, that climate change is a lot yuckier than composting. Um, with our service, we make it a little less yucky or un-yucky um, by giving you a clean container every time we pick up your full one. Why is the topic of waste so mysterious? Yeah, it's mysterious like our food system because we're detached from it. And the way to get more engaged with our food service, our food system and our waste system is to ask more questions. So everyone has heard of the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Have you heard that refuse has been added? Yes. What do you refuse? Well, refusing things like swag or uh, giveaways is a great way to reduce. And I tend to refuse anything that does not support my zero waste lifestyle. Would you like to see some, a few things that I didn't refuse? Yes. This is like the comic relief part. Um, I got this at the, uh, the Green Living Festival. It's a, like a to-go container that I can slip into my purse. But what's great about it is that it pops up 
you know, and so it gets bigger. And so I can take leftovers from restaurants, but I can also take compost home, like banana peels or apple cores or something like that. So Erlene and I went to the Illinois County's Solid Waste Management Association meeting. And we, when we were registering, we said, oh, we don't want any swag. And, they, uh, and then we were like, oh, wait, what is it? And it turned out that it was a reusable stainless steel straw plus something to clean it with and a fork, knife, and spoon. So that was great too. But this is my favorite piece of swag that I've ever, ever gotten. Um, Independent Recycling Services was giving these out in an event I did last year on Earth Day, an in-person event. Um, and we are the, Erlene can correct me if I'm wrong, we're a composting subcontractor for them. Yes. And so this is like a little tote that is like our 32 gallon totes. See, it even opens up. I always say if Barbie composted, this is what she would use. What do you refuse, Erlene? Well, of course, I refuse straws at restaurants, and I bring my own container so that I can uh, not get a styrofoam container when I have leftovers. But um, through Collective Resource, we also educate our businesses about what kind of materials they're using in their packaging. And um, it was great to be involved with U.S. Food um, for an afternoon. They were, they were working on how to reduce um, what has to go into the landfill. What about reduce? I mean, yeah, what about reduce? Sorry. I reduce my food waste through composting. And when I first started, I realized uh, that there were, there were things that I was buying and maybe not eating um, like, you know, getting too much of something. And so uh, I've really adjusted my buying habits and I just tend to, you know, buy a lot less. How about you? Well, this is my favorite mantra and I don't think I ever get through a talk like this without sharing that buy what you eat and eat what you buy. That makes a lot of sense. Lately people have been shopping uh, or actually looking at their pantries differently. More like, less like storage and more like dinner. Uh, I also have reduced the amount of meat that I consume because that's another great way to reduce my uh, carbon footprint. And um, if you're interested in exploring this option, starting with one day a week is a great option. And the website Meatless Mondays has a lot of good information on it. Uh, including recipes, but also um, toolkits for restaurants and for uh, schools to, to implement that program. So next step is reuse. Um, our corporate office runs very efficiently by me reusing part of my home. So there's no commute and no second heating system. All of our administration staff and sales team also use parts of their homes, reuse parts of their home. So we were well prepared for this shelter in place. Um, at the garage, one of the things that we use to reduce is a power washer so that we um, don't run as much water down the drain when we're providing clean containers. So the compost can keep happening. Personally, I love to reuse grocery bags. Um, and I like to reuse paper that comes my way to line my countertop container. Um, and I also um, love carrying my own silverware, which we've talked about, so I don't have to take any plasticware when I order food. Cool. So I would recommend looking at your own operation or home and seeing if you can reuse things there. But there's also this newish company called Recommitted Supplies that takes like new packaging from businesses and then um, resells it at less than retail price to anybody who wants to buy it. Um, and, and right now they're offering free local delivery. Thanks. For the big picture, uh, we reuse our food scraps by buying food scrap amended Illinois compost uh, organics where we take our material to get processed. We'll sell it to you by the truckload and deliver it. So the last R is recycle. If you've done all of the other R's, you should have a lot less to recycle. 
Yes, people ask us if composting is cheaper and it's really not, but it's sustainable and sustainability is what we need for the long run. I've witnessed composting as an introduction to many other sustainable practices that businesses can take, like reducing single-use plastic. We've also witnessed customers who, um, who are composting at home and then bring the idea to their workplace and then vice versa. They learn about composting from their workplace and then start to do it at home. Yes, and this has also been true with faith communities. Um, who have composting programs and educate their congregants about sustainable efforts. Um, I was able to experience this firsthand all the way since 2010, the Unitarian Church of Evanston has been composting and educating their parishioners. So that's really exciting. I'm engaged there and I'm gonna be part of their virtual Earth Day celebration tonight at seven, which is open to everybody. So I hope you'll join us. Collective Resource Compost is now working with 15 faith communities that are doing a great job at spreading the green word about composting. If you start composting with us, you become part of our community and we're very serious about supporting our community. This is an unusual time we're living in where we would be talking a lot about zero waste events at this point, but since we're not gathering, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Zero waste events are a great way to educate. There's something really tangible about seeing how little is being sent to a landfill, how little is being created. We are also grateful that Hal and Rachel have already talked about the city of Evanston's uh, climate action and resilience plan. And um, they've, um, we really want everybody to know about it in so many different ways. So pages 15 and 16 are on Evanston's zero waste goals and initiatives. And we find it to be a helpful tool when you're starting a compost pro pro program. The city is asking for all of our help to get to zero waste by 2050, if not sooner. We are happy to be an essential business and that we continue to divert food scraps. We love what we do and the customers who do this with us. Thank you. Thank you. We are, we're happy to ask or, or answer any questions at the end, but we're going to pass it back to Hal Sprague, who's going to talk to you now about community solar. Very nice job, um, Erlene and Mary Beth. Thanks a lot. Great presentation. Thank you. You made me yes. chuckle. Thank you guys very much. That was really well done. Yeah, it was good. Very good. Now I have to make sure my screen's working because it doesn't seem to be. You know, technology is a there we go. thing, isn't it? Okay. I'm going to mute myself. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, good, good, thanks. So yeah, so I'm gonna take just a couple minutes. I'm, I'm not going to try to make everybody an expert in community solar <clears throat> because there are opportunities going forward in the next few weeks for you to join a webinar. We're doing webinars, uh, my company's doing webinars pretty much every week now for the next couple months at least. Um, but I wanna give you the thumbnail sketch. And the thumbnail sketch is that <clears throat> for most people think of going solar as meaning, well, I'm gonna put panels on my house or on my garage, um, and it's gonna cost me thousands of dollars, and only after a certain number of years will I actually be saving any money because it's such an expensive thing. Um, there are lots of reasons why, uh, aside from money, that you might not want to or be able to do that. Um, and community solar is a really terrific alternative to that, which I'll tell you more about in a second. But just as sort of a first step here, let's talk about why we need renewables at all in Illinois. Um, you probably know most of these things already. The people that are on the call realize how much energy is being used by all of us in Illinois 
with our transportation, our manufacturing, our houses, commercial activity, all of those things <clears throat> use lots and lots of energy. And most of it is coming from fossil fuels and nuclear power, which is not good for several reasons, and not the least of which is climate change. And we are less than 10% renewable at this point. And the state, <clears throat> fortunately, we have a state legislature and governor who, who are very interested in moving us quickly along the line of scaling up our renewables. And the law has now been changed uh, several times in Illinois with more to come in ways that incentivize uh, a greater and quicker scaling up of solar and wind energy. The latest version of the law that was doing this was called the Future Energy Jobs Act. Right now, the legislature is looking at the Clean Energy Jobs Act to continue that process. But um, as I was saying, for those of us that maybe don't want to or cannot, for various reasons, add solar panels to our own property for reasons listed here. Roof is too small, not facing the right direction, have a lot of trees, which we don't want to cut down. Uh, we don't have control over our roof. Anybody that's in a condo or a rental apartment cannot necessarily have control over the roof and put panels on. Um, and of course, it's just the cost and the disruption of construction are sometimes barriers. <clears throat> so what Community Solar does, and in this case, I am working with a company called Clearway, Community, Clearway Energy Partner uh, Group, and I work for Trajectory Energy Partners, which is sort of doing the boots on the ground, talking to people like you and, and giving you the education and, and hopefully convincing you to sign up for this if you can't put the solar panels on your building. Clearway is the developing company. They now are in Illinois. They, in, they have already been in four other states that have laws that are similar to Illinois now. Illinois is, is coming along behind some of the other states like Minnesota, Colorado, New York, and Massachusetts. And now, so, so they haven't actually built sites in Illinois. They've built hundreds of sites in those other states. But this year they're building sites in Illinois and they build these sites out away from the cities where there's a lot of open space. And just as an example, they'll go to a farmer who has you know, maybe several hundred acres, but needs some extra cash and can break off 15 or 20 acres and lease that property for a field or an array of solar panels. <clears throat> and, and in doing, and so in doing that, we're help, you know, that they're helping the farmer um, and they're, but they're, they can fit 7,000 panels, let's say, out there in a field of, of, uh, of about 15 acres. So, but they're out far away. So from, from where the energy is being used. So they build those, uh, those panels out in the hinterland, but they're, they're near enough to a grid connection so that they can, uh, they, can, um, they can run that power from those solar panels directly into the grid out where the, uh, where the panels are. And when they do that, the solar energy going into ComEd's grid, let's say, ComEd has a service area in, that covers most of Northern Illinois. When all of that solar power goes into the grid, it basically pushes out the nuclear and the fossil fuel power from the, from the grid. If solar power is coming in, ComEd doesn't have to turn on generator number 42 or generator number 15 and run the coal plant because they're having this extra energy come in that's renewable. They don't have to, and they don't want to pay for the coal or the natural gas or the nuclear power because it's more expensive actually to do that. So by creating these new sites that are solar out in the, that are large, it, it helps take the place of those polluting uh, sources of energy. So then your, which I'll go through in a minute, your uh, bill uh, will be reduced by the power that, uh, that is generated by panels that are uh, allocated to you. And here is the story uh, at the ground level for you. And I'm gonna try to get rid of, um, I don't know if I can do it, uh, the pictures, but I won't. I will, I will go do this by memory. Here is kind of a, a mini version of your current ComEd bill. So if you are a subscriber, to the Clearway Solar Community Solar Project. This is the before. This is what your ComEd bill looks like today. Uh, you have a supply part of your bill, 
which represents the actual energy being given to you to, to use. You have a delivery part of your bill, which pays ComEd for the actual maintenance of the wires. And then you have the typical taxes and fees. And the total cost of that hypothetical bill might be something like $200 in a, in a month, a monthly bill. So now you become a, co a community solar subscriber and Clearway has built the site and they've turned it on and we have power running into the grid and you homeowner, let's say, uh, might have 22 panels out of 7,000 allocated to you with your name on them that says, you know, Sprague power coming from these 22 panels goes into the grid and we're going to uh, credit him for that power from those panels. And we're gonna tell ComEd about that at the end of every month. So here's what your situation looks like as a subscriber. The ComEd bill, it looks the same to begin with, right? But on the right-hand side, there is a Clearway bill. Before, but before Clearway sends a bill, it's going to calculate your input your power, and it's gonna send that information to ComEd, and it's gonna say, look, Sprague created $70 worth of energy, and ComEd is gonna take that $70 and simply subtract it from your ComEd bill. So you get an immediate reduction in your ComEd bill because you've put that power and replaced the power that ComEd was going, would otherwise have given you. Now on the clear, then Clearway comes back and charges you for the same credits, but they only charge you 80%. So that's why, and that's why on the right-hand side, you see that there is a discount of 20%. So the overall combination of the two bills that you'd get is $186. And it's 20% it's off of the top line of your bill, not the whole thing. But so, that, so you can do several things here. You can put it, ha, you can uh, support new solar energy in Illinois, adding to the portfolio of renewables. You can be helping the farmer out in the field, raise, have a little bit of extra money so they don't have to sell the farm or they can, they can do more food and less feed. Um, you are creating jobs in Illinois. These are local jobs that they uh, use to build and maintain these sites. You can do all of that with no down payment, no investment. You don't own anything. You don't have to pay anything. All you have to do is pay your bill. <laughs> and it's going to be a lower bill than you otherwise were paying. So you get a guaranteed savings for the entire time that you're in the program, which can be as long as 20 years. Every month for 20 years, you get a guaranteed discount. Now, <clears throat> that's how Clearway does it. Other companies that are doing this um, also give a 20% discount. There's one other company that I know of that gives a 20% discount. And that's very different from the companies that are coming to you and saying, we're going to give you green energy. Many of those companies give you green energy by purchasing renewable energy certificates that come from somewhere else in the world, in the, in the country. And they don't really provide new green energy, new renewable energy to Illinois. They just show you, they just allow you to say on paper that you are using green energy or you're using renewable energy, which is not quite the same thing as building new renewable energy in Illinois. So I, we believe that this is a better alternative than use for, for the environment and for Illinois, uh, than using the programs that purchase renewable energy certificates through those other companies. Um, that's probably better than doing nothing, than just using ComEd. Uh, it's even better to put solar panels on if you can do that. But this uh, community solar is a growing and a very large and respectable way to be green, truly green in Illinois, and actually save a little money in the process. And this is a website, if you, if you want to, it's pretty simple, you can write down this website. A lot of the things that I'm saying uh, are on this website. There's a recording of the longer uh, webinars that we're giving, the wilmettcommunitysolar.org site. Um, it's a great resource for you. There's a FAQ or frequently asked questions page. And we will be doing more webinars. If you're interested, just contact me and I will uh, get you involved in, this, in the, uh, the education process. And uh, this is what the site looks like if you were to go to Clearway and sign up. 
you go to their site and you can actually do it yourself. You say join now. And there, there is no penalty today from now until August if you sign up now. There is no penalty for canceling out of the contract at some point. So you could get into it. And if in a couple of years you don't like it, you can just leave and there's no penalty. Um, so this is all part of one company's approach to community solar in Illinois. Um, and again, I hope that's helpful. It's, it's not the long version, it's just the short version. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, but hopefully that's good enough for now. You can understand what I've been saying. Next time you hear it, you'll have a better idea. And there's my information for your information if you wanna follow up. And that's all I have. And I will take questions later. I'm gonna stop sharing now. There you go. Well, I think it, it thanks a lot, Hal. Um, really interesting alternative. So we do have some questions. I think we're in that question period. Um, question, the first question I've got, we got was from Mary Jane who asked, can I just add compost to my garden or do I have to mix it with soil? So I imagine that is... Uh, uh, so I can jump in here. Um, so you don't want to take raw food scraps and add them into your garden. I think that's what you're asking. They should go through a process of breaking down um, what we call cooking, but your pile could also be cold. So, um, so you know, if you want to dig a hole and bury your food scraps, that's a possibility, but it, it's really not the best way to go about um, composting so so no I meant with your compost like if we bought some compost from um, oh from organics yes yes um, are you're asking if it's garden grade is that what you're asking yes it is garden grade you can that's what you I mean there's different things that you can buy but yes you can buy garden grade compost great um, the other question that I have is, um, is with uh, solar panels, and uh, this is directed at Hal, and that is, is it preferable to put solar panels on your roof if you can? Is that the preferred practice? That's a great question, and I think the answer is yes. Putting solar panels on your own property is what we generally call behind the meter which kind of means that whatever the power is that's produced by those panels first goes directly into your home and gets used by you and you get all of it. You get 100% of that power. Anything that's extra, because in Illinois we have what's called net metering, you have a smart meter which, uh, which takes the excess and puts it back into the grid and ComEd is required to pay you for that. So, and then later on you can be credited with that on your on the during at night or during the time of year when you're not uh, use when you're not producing any power, so that's that's the sort of the best alternative because it's immediate. It's right here. Uh, you did also create jobs, um, but you're producing power right here and, and for yourself. And it's it's actually you you can over if you have the capital to build it, which is thousands of dollars, but you and you can also use the the federal and the state. Um, subsidies and rebates it reduces that cost quite a bit and if you're in a low income uh area or if you're a low income uh property owner you can actually get pretty much all of that cost of that uh paid for by the federal and the state uh subsidies so that's called solar for all and i could tell you more about that offline but i i, I say as i to answer the question yes putting the panels on is the best the next best thing i would say is probably community solar and then the next best thing after that would be the green, the rec-based uh, program. And then the last thing is, you know, not doing anything at all, I guess. Okay. So some of the other questions we had, it sounds like how you primarily work with the community solar, you don't, you are not involved with the solar panels project at all. Uh, that, that's right. My, my company is doing community solar uh, only. But I did recently put solar panels on my garage, and so, and and I not to endorse anybody in particular here, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share uh, information on the company that did that. It's it's actually kind of exciting. Um, I could I could show you if I if I was smart enough to quickly pull it up here. There's an app. 
on my phone that uh, tells me at any moment in time during the day how many kilowatt hours I'm generating. And I look at it several times a day. It's kind of like looking at the stock market or something if you were a stock investor. Uh, it's, so it's kind of fun to own that and to see that happening. Um, but, and, it, and it was well done. I really uh, think that the people who are doing this in Illinois now are, are really very good at it. So I can share that if somebody wants to know. And, and then pricing, you said, can be anywhere from thousands of dollars to if you're in the right, if you're in the right situation, could be nothing. Right. And that, that's a complicated story. But yes, if there is a program in Illinois called Solar for All, there, there's an agency in Illinois called the Illinois Power Agency that is sort of by law required uh, to, to um, purchase the renewable energy certificates from the individuals who put on solar panels. And so for me, they're going to buy my renewable energy credits certificates for a certain amount, which makes my costs lower. It's sort of they're giving mm -hmm. me back some of the money that I spent. If I were in, if I were a low income person, if I fit that category, I believe I was told <clears throat> um, that they would buy my RECs at such a high price that it would pay for all the cost of my solar panels. Because okay. the people who are in that income bracket simply don't have thousands of dollars to spend on it, but they want to encourage them to do it. So they created that program to make it uh, basically uh, cost free. Okay. Um, Hal, can you do us a favor and then share with us the, the name of the company that you use? Because there are some folks who are interested in following sure. up with that. Sure. Um, uh, you, you may do that right now or? Well, you can send it to me and we're going to follow up with all of the uh, sure. attendees with some links because we got some links from Arlene and Mary Beth that we want to share. So we're going to do a post attendee document and get, get that stuff to everybody. Okay. Because I'm probably also going to want to send everybody a survey and say, what did you think of the, of the event today? Just, uh, you know, because it's something a little bit different for us today. So we want to make sure we can get everybody's needs. Um, so, and so it, one last question for solar, a lot of questions on solar. Um, one last question on solar was, so community solar, if you're talking about folks who live in an apartment kind of situation, that's really kind of the, that's the best option um, that you've got available. And then the next one might be buying the, the credits, but that's probably the best option available. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. That's that's a good question. Thank you. Um, the, another question, which is about recycling plastic, and this is an interesting um, question, which is how much plastic is actually recycled and made into something else? I don't know I, that, that question. I don't know who has the answer. Erlene or Mary Beth, you you talk about. Do you want me to that? jump in here? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. So, um, so there. If you are putting the correct things in your recycling bin, so it's very important. Um, so they're they're really looking for plastic bottles, plastic tubs. You want to make sure that you're following the guidelines for your community. Um, Kumar Jensen says, when in doubt, throw it out. Don't put it in the recycling bin if you're like hoping that it's recyclable. Also, um, so those things then do get made into other things, um, but plastic cannot be recycled indefinitely. So, you know, th there's a limit to how many times it can go through the recycling. The other plastic that we get to recycle here in Evanston is the film plastic. But again, it's really important to only give us the stretchy plastic, like the produce bags um, or the frozen fruit bags. Not You can't put your potato chip bags and, and, and everything that you hope could be you, you know, uh, used in that recycling program. Um, and so since it's actually the collective resource crew that sorts all that plastic <laughs> for the film plastic thing, we really want you to pay attention to only give us the things that are recyclable. And those get turned into um, park benches and other plastic, um, what would you call like railroad ties and are used in parks and playgrounds. So that material is definitely being recycled into something useful. That's good. So um, I wanted to jump in just and say just what we said before, which is that, well, actually I didn't say this before. It's kind of surprising. I usually say reduce, reuse, recycle. It's a hierarchy. 
And the question, it, a better question would be, how can I reduce the amount of plastic I'm using? Not, can I recycle this plastic? Yeah, actually there was a uh, NPR uh, segment the other day with Jerome McDonald talking mm -hmm. about how uh, he was trying to basically live a plasticless life, but it's, all, it's very difficult as he said, but when you go into the store, you do have some choices about whether to pick something that's packaged in plastic or not. And he said that that's something that everybody can do. And maybe right. if enough of us did it, then the uh, manufacturers would get the message and they would, uh, you know, make use less plastic in packaging. So we always say when we're talking about zero waste events, it's a zero waste goal. There's always going to be stuff that you can't recycle but for whatever reason, you just felt like you had to have it. Um, and so your whole life could be a zero waste goal of just trying to reduce what you can't dispose of responsibly. Yeah, I mean, it gets into the bottled waters and things like that. Uh, I mean, one of, one of the things that, that somebody has said to me and I thought was very interesting was, you know, what, what do bottled water companies produce? Bottles. They don't produce water, they produce bottles. That's really their product because they didn't make the water. The water is, and in many cases, if you're buying some, some brands are actually municipal water sources just simply put in bottles. Right. The two worst are Dasani and Aquafina. Those are municipal water sources put in bottles by Coca-Cola and I forget what the other one is. So Roger, I know that you're a performer. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, something great that you could do when you're performing is to have a reusable water bottle. And so you're showing everybody, whenever you're taking a sip between songs and you're a great performer, I've seen you. you. Um, this would be like <laughs> a great, uh, it would add to your performance as far as I'm concerned, if you were drinking out of a reusable water bottle. Now you see, that's funny because one of our writers is that we require a case of bottled water. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Pitcher. Maybe pitchers. Maybe that's what we do. Maybe we now ask for pitchers. But yeah, one of our writers is a case of bottled water. Um, so there you go. Well, water. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mary yeah. Beth, you have put me onto some like Instagram hashtags and pages about zero waste life. I, and, and it's actually made it kind of fun. And I think there's a that back to that psychology piece of like not feeling bad about every poor environmental choice you make but right. celebrate you know striving and celebrating the wins um but i've had right. definitely had some fun with it um, right it is fun i always say so i have this friend who said to me recently i didn't know you were so frugal and i was like i don't even think of myself as frugal it's more like resourceful and mm -hmm. and also I just, I feel like zero waste is this game that I play every day. And some days I win and some days I lose, but it really does, it does help to have these other people who are playing the same game and uh, to learn from them. So like you can follow the zero waste has hashtag or follow some of the people who have zero waste in their um, Instagram handles. Roger, can I ask a verbal question? Uh, typing it in and actually I want to sort of expand on the question that was typed in there um, this goes to the businesses in Evanston and in particular the uh, the restaurants <clears throat> I have talked to a friend of mine who is a restaurant owner who uh, believes or believed that recycling in his restaurant was more expensive than not recycling and Brittany I don't want to put you on the spot because I don't know if that's something that you uh, know the details on, but I have been told by other people like Becky and people like maybe Kumar that that's the program is set up so that it's actually cheaper to do re some at least a certain amount of recycling than it is to throw it in the trash. Yeah, is so, that something um, that you can talk about? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the cost for recycling really depends on how how much you're throwing out it's really based on the the volume of of uh, the recyclables that you're using so it, it really depends on 
how much. And I think there's something that a lot of businesses don't know is that you can actually get a free 95 gallon recycling cart for your business. Um, if you don't currently recycle now, you can get that as a, an option. And so, you know, it really goes back to the monitoring of how much waste you're producing. So, um, you know, the cost varies, but I would say that it's pretty comparable to your waste, your trash services. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any more questions from anybody? I would just like to, to add also that this, this speaks to that, that uh, line of walking personal responsibility versus pushing for policy change. You know, what can we do to make it easy and affordable for people to live this lifestyle instead of, you know, I th the analogy is like oil companies are thrilled that you're staring at that peanut butter jar deciding if it's better to rinse it out or to, so you can recycle it or, you know, that it, um, I'm hoping that we can all be activists and trying to, to shift the, the whole policy so things can, it's easier to live this way. Yes. Sounds good to me. Any other questions from anybody? Um, well, I'm going to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for coming and, and spending some time with us. We had a great session. I really got a lot out of this. I hope everybody got a lot out of it. Um, we did record it, so we'll let you know where the recording will be available. And um, we're going to follow up with 